Today, I want to talk about the problems with Mormonism. Now, growing up, I wasn't raised with any religion, went to public school. There was Mormons there. They were friendly and nice people. And I think there's a lot of things we can all emulate about them, that they take their faith very seriously as a culture. They have these good family values, having lots of kids, as we all should, that they take their faith seriously. Of course, there are abuses of this, just like anything. People go too far, but I think those aspects are good in that they have these, you know, missionary trips for their young people, you know, requiring more of their members, and you're going to get more devout members. I think those are very good things about them. Now, however, Mormonism as a religion is heretical, and I will explain why. There's multiple different fronts that it falls into heresy. Mormonism teaches that the church fell away at some point, that it needed to be restored by a new prophet, Joseph Smith, when that is the exact opposite of what the Bible says. The Bible says that the church is a pillar and foundation of truth, that we must hold on to the traditions of the apostles. One way we can do that is to read the apostolic fathers, actually knew the apostles, and we can see what they taught. They taught things like the Trinity which Mormonism does not teach the Trinity. Joseph Smith very clearly rejected it. Mormonism falls into the heresy of tritheism. Tritheism is a heresy that was refuted very early on. If we want to understand what Christianity is, that should be our approach, to look at the very beginning and see what they are teaching and see whatever church we're going to, is it teaching the same thing? The only church that that is true in is the Orthodox Church. We know this by looking at church history. We know Jesus came, he died, he resurrected, there was Pentecost, the birth of the church. The apostles went out and they spread their churches all throughout the known world. They ordained successors and their successors ordained successors and this tradition lived on this fire. Again, the church would never defect because God, the Holy Spirit, guides the church. And we can see all these very important things like the liturgy, like the Trinity, like infant baptism, which is taught clearly in the Bible. Infants are a part of nations. And we can see that the church fathers wrote this. And so where did Mormonism come? Again, we have this church that was founded at Pentecost. And we can see that the church continued on and had all these ecumenical councils. There was a great schism in 1054 where the Catholic Church split from the Orthodox Church because of forgeries and changes in doctrine. And then in the 1500s, because of the Catholic Church's errors, there was the Protestant Reformation. And that led to endless more schism. And then all these Protestant groups come to America. And then in the 1800s, we get this new prophet who has to restore Christianity with his New Testament that's revealed to him by an angel. When the Bible in Galatians says that even if an angel comes and gives a different gospel, let them be accursed. Very clearly condemning Mormonism. A very similar situation happened with Muhammad and Quran in the 600s, where they say an angel comes to them and reveals to them a new gospel. And this is not in continuity with the Bible because the church does not defect. The Bible teaches infant baptism. The Bible teaches a trinity. And we are taught to worship God in a certain way, in Eucharistic worship. That again is from the tradition of the apostles. So if you're a Mormon watching this video, I challenge you to read the Apostolic Fathers and the Church Fathers and see what the Orthodox Church has always taught and compare that with what Mormonism teaches because they are the opposite. Many Mormons may get confused with the word concept fallacy because they may have something called the bishop. They may say, oh, we believe in the Trinity, but do you mean the same thing as what the early church meant, as what the Bible meant? That is key. We need to hold fast to the traditions of the apostles that we can read about and we can see lived out by the Orthodox Church. And what I think will be most helpful to any Mormon watching this video is I interviewed an ex-Mormon who came to Orthodox Christianity and he is very well researched. One day I was walking in my neighborhood and I see the Mormon kids on the bike. They came up to me and they offer me the Book of Mormon. So I take it because I'm interested in learning more about them. But I just asked them some questions like, I brought up everything that I just brought, and I also brought up important early Christian practices like monasticism. This was always taught in the first centuries. Why does Mormonism not have that if they claim to be that church revived versus the Orthodox Church, which has been living in perpetual, we still have monasticism. Like the, the Mormon kid didn't even know about it. I said, how do you know that this is from God? And he said, well, I just read it and I pray on it and God just reveals to me. But ultimately, that's depending so much on your own reason. The idea of being able to follow your feelings is really crucial to Mormon conversion. 
Um, they're very Protestant where they just tell someone to read the Book of Mormon, pray about it in you know, the privacy of your room, and God will speak to you personally and tell you that it's true in your mind and in your heart. You'll have a burning in the bosom. So this is like, they always went back against the wall when you're talking to them. They'll always rely on this experience that they had of the divine that they would label that feeling or thought. And so this is where you actually can make the connection to postmodernism. Because if you have the idea that your feelings and you are like an infallible judge of your feelings, and you know when God is talking to you, and you know when it's the right thing being told to you, if you think you're infallible in judging that, you have no right to judge other people who are living out their thoughts and feelings in ways you find offensive and in ways you find destructive. And so this honestly was one of my big breaking points where I'm like, that is not scriptural, first of all, because in the scriptures we learn that, you know, the heart is full of lies, it's full of deceit, who can know the human heart is what we're taught in the Old Testament. But I think also it, it just goes to, you know, this idea that you're infallible, which, again, as we know, comes out of the Reformation. They rejected the Pope, and they made all individuals their own Pope. Mm -hmm. And I think if you ever are talking to a Mormon about this and their spiritual experience, I think you can ask them that, like, do you believe you're infallible when it comes to knowing the difference between your own thoughts and feelings and the voice of the Lord? And if they say yes, they have now placed themselves above even their own prophets, who they would acknowledge have made mistakes when it comes to listening to the voice of the Lord. Um, and, and you'd have to just point that out to them. I mean, there's a story of Joseph Smith. He was going to sell the copyright to the Book of Mormon because they were so desperate for money. He, was, he told his apostles to go to Canada and sell the copyright to the Book of Mormon, which in itself is a really weird thing to do. But he said, the Lord told me, you need to go do this. They go, and the person tells them, no, I don't I don't want to buy it. It's the failure the mission is. And Joseph Smith's quote at that point is, sometimes we're listening to the Spirit of the Lord, sometimes we're listening to our own feelings, and sometimes we're listening to, like, evil spirits. And he wasn't able to tell the difference at that point in time. Like, he just admitted it. Like, I'm not infallible <laughs> when it comes to knowing the yeah. difference. Like, I was I was misled, basically. I, I suffered tree less. Yeah. But so now, like, individual members of the Mormon Church will say, well, I don't have that problem. I know, <laughs> you know, with a, they'll always say, like, I have a feeling I cannot deny. I have an undeniable witness is the word they'll use. So they're basically saying that they're more infallible than their own prophets when it comes to listening to the Lord and what he wants, his will for them. And I think that's just a very, very dangerous place to be, as Father Sarah from Rose has pointed out. The most dangerous place spiritually you can be is to think you are not open to deception. I, I think that's just like, that was eye-opening for me, because I was like, wow, talk about a large dose of humility. I think the most common misconceptions is that um, people think that a lot of weird doctrines come from the Book of Mormon. They actually don't. If you read the Book of Mormon, it's actually pretty tame as far as what it contains, and um, it's pretty much just like, 19th century Protestant low church Christianity revival Christianity mm -hmm. is a lot of what you'll find when you read the Book of Mormon. In fact, um, the God that you read about in the Book of Mormon, it's actually modalism in the Book oh. of Mormon where Jesus himself is saying, I am the Father and the Son. And it even said that Mary bore the Father of all mankind. Like it uses a lot of language um, that's actually modalism. And it's, it's all about just faith, repentance, baptism, receiving the gift of the Holy Ghost. It doesn't mention any temple ordinances. It does, In fact, it's actually anti-Masonic, um, because at that time when Joseph Smith wrote the Book of Mormon, there was a lot of newspaper articles regarding William Morgan, who exposed the Masonic rites. And so Masons were seen as kind of like the bad guys at that time. Um, Andrew Jackson was running for president. He was a Freemason. So Joseph Smith also wrote a lot of anti-Masonry talking points into the Book of Mormon. He called them secret combinations and how they would overthrow all the governments of the world. But again, this is early Mormonism we're talking about, where it was, again, just meant to be like a more simplistic version of Christianity. It was meant to be anti-Masonic. It was meant to be, hey, you believe on the Lord, you'll be saved. Water baptism is in there as well. But Again, it doesn't have all the weird things you often associate with Mormonism uh, being a heretical belief system. Um, that stuff came later uh, in Joseph Smith's life. It came about a decade later when he was in the Nauvoo area. He started practicing polygamy. He became a Freemason. 
Mm-hmm. Um, so that's, that's where you actually get different flavors of Mormonism, depending on which um, period of time we're talking about and which book we're talking about. Yeah. And Joseph Smith, he was from New York, but I know a lot of you, a lot of Mormonism is focused in like Utah, uh, Utah, Idaho area. It was like revealed the golden tablets and everything. And that's where it kind of got weird, like, like later in his life. Yeah. And so this is where we get into like things that start to make Mormonism not such a straightforward story of him being called as a prophet, because when he was living in the Palmyra, New York area, he was well known as a glass looker. So he would actually look into a rock and he would tell people where treasure was buried. I mean, this is a matter of history that the Mormon church now, you know, accepts and is is like willing to come forward with. Um, So he was all into really digging for treasure, going on these treasure digs. They had a lot of interesting like metaphysical beliefs regarding the treasure that there were like guardians, you know, guarding the (laughs) treasure. Um, and that you had to do a certain spell in order to like let the guardian or the guardian would then let you through if you said like certain keywords. So yeah, he was doing weird things. He was actually taken to court over it because he told someone he could look into, you know, a seer stone and tell them where treasure is buried. Um, and he was actually charged with, he was originally charged with disturbing the peace, but they let him off because he was pretty young. I think he was like 18 at the time. Um, so this is actually one of the first things that was written about by um, Michael D. Quinn. He was a former Mormon historian, and he was actually excommunicated from the Mormon church for pointing out the occult and the magic that played a role in Joseph Smith's early life and development. Um, and so this is where we get into things that the Mormon church used to say, oh, well, that's anti-Mormonism, don't believe it. But now they say, okay, yeah, he did you know, use magic and occult practices. Mm. And it's very similar to what he used to find the Book of Mormon. In fact, he used that same seer stone to translate the Book of Mormon. So once you start getting into that, and and I've even heard a Mormon apologist say, you know what, I think it's really cool that he used things that, you know, John Dee used, because John Dee was a famous glass looker from the British Empire, and he would write in the Enochian language as he was seeing things on a seer stone. Um, Yeah, there's people who even say, I think it's awesome that he did that. I mean, they're usually just kind of gaslighting you at that point. But yeah, so you could make connections to him being visited by an angel. Um, At one point, he said it was Moroni. At another point, he said it was Nephi. Um, But this this angel almost stands as like that guardian of the treasure, and the treasure is the golden plate. Um, So you see a lot of those patterns play out. He has to visit it like three times, and then finally the, the angel lets him take the plate. But to kind of end my point here, the weirdest thing about all of this, all that time that he was being prepared by the Lord to receive the plates and to translate them into English, um, when he goes to translate the plates the first time, um, you might have seen the South Park episode about this, he actually gives them to his associate, Martin Harris, who's helping him with the translation process, because Martin Harris is giving all of his money to publishing this sacred book. So his wife is very skeptical, and she's like, I want to oh, see yeah. these manuscripts. And this is where we get the, the lost 116 pages that South Park actually featured in their episode, because she kind of knew it was a hoax, and she kind of knew that her husband was naive, and so she didn't want him being taken to the, the cleaners over this you know, fake book. So she ended up destroying, we're pretty sure she threw the manuscript in the fire, all 116 pages that Joseph Smith had translated up to that point. And so you think Joseph Smith would just retranslate it, but he doesn't. He actually starts at a different part in the Book of Mormon because he said mm. the Lord told him to, and that people would use that to, I don't know, get catch him or something in a lie. But the weird thing is, at that point, he's now beginning the translation process of the Book of Mormon we have today, and he doesn't once use the gold plates. He never uses them to translate. He looks into a hat with a seer stone in it, and that's how we get the Book of Mormon. So never were the gold plates used, which Uh, is so weird because they were preserved for centuries and wars were fought over them in the Book of Mormon. And he had to run with them. By the way, they weigh about 100 pounds. So he had to run with them while mobs were trying to get him because these were his old gold digging associates who were trying to attack him because he was up to something that they weren't involved in. So it's just weird that he went through all this trouble, but yet the Book of Mormon we have today was never translated by him looking at the gold plates and being able to be told by the Lord what the English was. Um, but if you look at Mormon art, a lot of it does show him studying the gold plate. 
So again, this is another lie. Um, it's just dishonest for the Mormon church to publish these pictures of him looking at the gold plate and reading out in English what they say. That never happened. It was him looking at a seer stone. Do they still have the gold plates or do they like lose them? You know? So that, that's like where we don't know oh. at all if he ever had them in the first place because he said they were taken up to heaven by the angel as soon oh. as he was done with the translation process. There were times when he translated and they were still on the ground. I mean, so they just had nothing to do with the translation process. Mm. There are people who claimed they saw them. Um, you have like the 11 witnesses who claim to see the golden plate. The problem there is if you actually look at their account, they say they saw them with their spiritual eyes. Um, so one of the things about 19th century Christianity is a lot of people were having visions. A lot of people were engaged in pre -left. And a lot of people would just claim they saw things. Like there's another story at the same time that Joseph Smith was around where people said they saw an angel on top of a roof. And there was like 20 witnesses to it. And they all signed a legal affidavit that they saw it. So a lot of people were seeing a lot of things in those days, and they were willing to even, like, put their reputation and name on the line. Um, and a lot of the witnesses to the Book of Mormon ended up joining other cults um, right after, you know, Joseph Smith was killed. They actually ended up uh, joining up with a man named James Strang, mm -hmm. who claimed he was the predecessor to Joseph Smith, and he also translated some records, and they all joined him, and they all witnessed his miracle, too. So it's just like these people were definitely, I don't want to say they were, like, super gullible but they were if you're looking for signs and you're looking for miracles like you will be deceived either by yourself or by yeah. supernatural forces that aren't of god but, mm. quite frankly yeah no that's so important that we're not seeking like signs and wonders because that's how the devil is gonna trick you the temple worship because the mormons are very secretive about their temples like normally they <laughs> don't allow video they don't allow non-mormons i believe so what is it like it in in there and like yeah what would you say about the temple yeah i would say um you don't go until you're 18 if, oh. um because that's yeah so my entire life i never went to the temple um until i was 18. so that that in itself kind of gives you like the idea of how you really need to be <laughs> well yeah. entrenched in mormonism before you ever see the inside of a temple and if you're a convert to mormonism they don't let you go in until you're a year in so again, you can wow. kind of see a pattern here of like not exposing people to it too soon. Yeah. But I grew up, you know, my parents would go on the weekends and I never knew anything about it. They would go to the temple, they'd come home, never speak of it. Um, and so I went for the first time when I was 18 before I left uh, for my mission. And um, well, I guess I would have been right about 19. And yeah, the first time you go and most people you talk to who are being honest, they're like just weirded out by it. <laughs> Um, because there's just mm -hmm. a lot of weird things and you see, but the thing is, is you're going with all your family and friends and they're there to support you. And so you're doing a lot of weird things and you're putting on weird clothes, but you're with all your Mormon family and friends and they're all doing it too. So it would be weird. It would take a special kind of person in that situation to be like, Oh no, this is horrible. I reject all of this. <laughs> Most people are going to be like, yeah. well, this is weird, but I guess I'm the one who has the problem because I just don't get it yet, but maybe I'll understand it more and more as I go to the temple more and more. Um, so yeah, I think like the best way to describe the temple in a nutshell is the main thing you go and do is watch a video where it goes through like what happened with Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. And this is where we kind of get into like um, Gnostic, Gnostic takes on the scriptures because um, this is one thing that always bothered me ever since I went to the temple is in the video, Adam and Eve are tempted by Satan, and these are like actors playing Adam and Eve and Satan. This, oh. that, back in the day, it was really cheesy, like <laughs> acting. Like it was really hard, like not to laugh or oh. too hard to take it seriously. Um, and by the way, you're in a dark room and you're watching a movie. That in itself is just kind of, you know, rubs you the wrong way. Yeah. Like, normal churches don't do that. <laughs> so I uh, would always watch it, and Satan would tempt Eve, um, but. Like, over time, they actually changed the video to um, make it so that Eve was kind of, like, doing the right thing by following Satan. Um, and this is where we get into, like, weird, like, Gnostic belief, where they believe, like, Lucifer is the light bringer. Um, Gnostics believe this. And they believe, like, he is, like, against the evil god 
uh, a Yahweh. This is what Gnostics believe traditionally. And so it, it has some of those elements to it because Mormons believe that the fall was a good thing and that it was actually a good thing for Adam and Eve to listen to Lucifer. And, and I always noticed that in the movie, and it always, like, rubbed me the wrong way. So I'm like, wait, we're being told to follow the example of Adam and Eve who disobeyed God and obeyed Lucifer. There's something wrong here. <laughs> and so, again, it's just like one of those things where it's not until you study, like, again, Gnosticism, that you can make sense of why they would have that in the video. But, again, over time, like, they also just had more, like, a feminist angle to it where Eve was the smart one because she followed Lucifer first, and she oh listened gosh. to her womanly intuition. She listened to her womanly intuition and, like, took, you know, partook of the fruit. But then it's funny because in the video they quote scripture where she says, the serpent beguiled me, and I did eat. So she's super smart and super savvy and knows exactly what she's doing, but then she's beguiled, according yeah. to the scriptures. So it, it just, it's a very awkward, like, theology that they have around the fall because they, they call it a fall forward. Like, they believe Adam and Eve needed to have children, and they couldn't have children unless they fell. Um, so they kind of make uh, it so that their God in their movie, he gives them conflicting commandments. Hey, I want you to multiply and replenish the earth, but I also want you to stay away from the fruit. And so they believe Eve was wise to go with the first commandment so that they could fulfill the second or sorry, they believe evil, evil is like to disobey when it comes to the fruit so that she could fulfill that commandment of multiplying or punishing the earth, which is also why, you know, Mormons are really big on having kids. Yeah. Because that's exactly what Adam and Eve were, was motivating them to, you know, disobey God. They needed to have kids so we could all come here and receive our bodies, um, you know, come from the spirit world and receive our bodies here on earth. Wow. That's um, so crazy. There, there's a lot more we could go into, but that in itself, um, you know, rubbed me the wrong way. And I, I'll just say one other story that started to, mm -hmm. we have a phrase in Mormonism called breaking your shelf. You start putting things on the shelf and eventually your shelf breaks uh, because you just notice weird things over time. The one of the shelf breaking moments for me was I was actually going to the temple with my mom and my wife and my mom mentioned that she's so glad that they don't do the weird penalties in the temple anymore. And I was like, wait, penalties? They used to do penalties? What kind of penalties? <laughs> and she said that um, pre-1990, they actually used to promise that if they ever gave up the secrets of the temple, they would have their throat split ear to ear. They would have their belly cut open and be disemboweled. They would have their heart ripped out of their chest, and they would be sawn in two. <laughs> oh, my God. And you had to, like, act... You had to act these out in the temple. You had to go like this, and you had to go like this. And where does this come from? It comes from the Freemasons. They used to do this as well. Um, so this is what Joseph Smith took from Freemasonry. He lifted this part of Freemasonry and um, introduced it into the Mormon endowment. And the Freemasons stopped doing it, I think, around the 80s. But the Mormons continued to do it for a few years after that. And then in 1990, they ran a survey because temple attendance was down. Shocker. <laughs> um, and they actually ran a survey asking the members why they're not attending the temple. And all the members came back in this anonymous survey and said, we think the temple is really weird and uncomfortable. <laughs> oh and so they were like, okay, it's gone. You know, remove it. <laughs> remove this piece of, you know, the restoration that was, yeah. you know, divinely inspired. It's out of here. Because yeah. the survey said so. Um, wow. So that also was just kind of like learning that history of how, first of all, that they were doing stuff that the Freemasons were doing. And then they just remove it willy-nilly just because the survey tells them to. That's also weird <laughs> yeah. because that means like you're now just tapping into the consensus of your membership rather yeah. than tapping into what God wants you to do and preserve. So, um, and then they also removed their Satan used to have his minion in the video and his minion was a Christian priest. Oh. And he was, a, he was a hireling of Satan trying to tempt Adam Eve with false doctrine. And it, what's really funny about that is how he introduces himself as he says, hey, would you like to learn about the Orthodox faith? That's what he says <laughs> to Adam and Eve. Wow. And then he starts talking about the Trinity. He strawmans the Trinity, and Adam and Eve like reject him, and they reject Satan. So they also took that priest out of their video because it offended a lot of former Christians who had become Mormon. They're like, well, I don't think my old priest from my previous church was you know, doing Satan's work. I think that's a bit heavy-handed. Of a, of a critique there. 
So they also removed that. And so now the temple we have, the Mormon temple today is much more tame. It doesn't have any of the penalties. It doesn't have the Christian priest in the video, you know, a hireling of Satan being offered money to deceive Adam and Eve. Um, they removed all that. And now women don't promise to obey their husbands. They used to. Um, that also really bugged me when they took that out because I took that oath in the temple and now it's gone. <laughs> and what now me and my wife are just yeah. like kind of, you know, making it up as we go because now we don't know like what yeah. the proper hierarchy is. So they removed that too because of feminism. Um, and so, yeah, it's just becoming a more politically correct version of what was once extremely Freemasonic and weird and creepy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Wow, that's like mind blown. Yeah, it sounds. Yeah, they're being kind of arbitrary. They're just kind of mo changing it with the times. Um, did they have like a priesthood or Eucharist or sacraments? Like any, I mean, they had a form of baptism, but like, yeah, like, what about the sacraments? Like, do they do any of those? They, they do. They actually call communion the sacrament. Um, mm -hmm. They have it every Sunday. It's literally just like Wonder Bread and like little paper cups with water in them oh. they did use wine uh they did use wine during the time of joseph smith but they're very against alcohol um which is funny because joseph smith drank alcohol all the time and so yeah. did brigham young their second prophet in fact utah was known for having huge breweries and that was one <laughs> of their like you know things that, that they used for purposes of industry to grow their civilization out west in the wild west so it's just weird because it didn't happen until the Prohibition era that they became super anti-alcohol. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, now they use water. They use water and bread. And um, yeah, they consider it more like along the Protestant lines of a memorial or a symbolic um, service, which actually blew me away when I started reading the Apostolic mm -hmm. Fathers. Like when I read St. Ignatius, um, who's actually the patron saint of our, our parish that we go to reading about him talking about how it was the actual body and blood of Christ was so mind-blowing to me because this is like the earliest church father you can read. And I don't know if people know this, but we didn't have the writings of St. Ignatius until like the last couple hundred years. And also it's so, it was so mind-blowing to me because when Mormons argue for a great apostasy, they point to the real presence and what they call transubstantiation. Mm -hmm. They point to that as one of the defining features of the apostate Catholic Church. So reading that so early on, like the real presence, and also reading Justin Martyr also talking about, you know, the liturgy and the Eucharist, I mean, that honestly was just like earth shattering for me because I was like, wow, this is yeah. like, this is it. This is like real Christianity. And again, continuity versus discontinuity. And um, I think also just reading about how Martin Luther, when he first came around, he also had a liturgy. John Calvin had a liturgy. So mm -hmm. this was like a norm for Christians to have a liturgy and believe in the real presence. Yeah. And it wasn't until later Protestants that we even had that. I, I believe it was Calvin who started to even question that. But again, we're talking like 1600 years in mm -hmm. to Christianity. So it was just amazing to see that. And um, yeah, they, they do consider it just kind of like a way to renew your baptismal covenant, is what they say, Mormons say. Um, but here's the other thing, like, I would do it every week, and I never felt like it was, it made any sense to me, because they don't do confession. Mm -hmm. um, Mormons only do confession if they do something seriously wrong, like if they, you know, commit the sin of fornication or adultery, or, like, you basically, it's usually sexual sins. Okay. Um, to be quite frank, like that's when they will go and do confessions and they have to do a, like penance where they can't take the sacrament for a while. But my entire time growing up, I never did confession because I thought I was like not ever committing any serious sins. And this is the other like difference between orthodoxy and Mormonism is Mormonism. You kind of can get like the impression, the general impression that you're doing a pretty dang good job <laughs> and you're pretty like on the ball if you're not breaking any of the major commandments um, and then learning about orthodoxy and just the wrestling and struggling against the flesh and the passions, I mean, that for me just made so much more sense because I was still feeling guilt, but I didn't have a reason to go and confess because Mormonism wasn't really set up for that. I think they kind of wanted people to have what's called toxic positivity where they're like, everything's going well for me so i'm just gonna mm. like stay put where i'm at 
And so you definitely see a lot of complacency where people are just like, yep, I'm good. I just <laughs> go to church every Sunday. I check the box for the different things. I pay my tithing, you know. Yeah. Um, they, they see it as just checking a box, and they're, they're kind of good in the Lord's eyes, in their mind. Yeah, so it sounds like it was very, like, legalistic, not really understanding the spirit of it, you know, just, yeah, like you're saying, checking off the box. So would they go to, like, an elder, or, like, what was, like, the priesthood like, or, like, who would you go to confess sins to? So this is where it also gets weird, because they would go to what's called their bishop, which is just, like, the equivalent of a priest. Um, he's mm -hmm. over a ward, the equivalent of a parish, and the problem is, is that a bishop is usually just a guy who lives down the street from you, who's, like, a <laughs> chiropractor or a dentist or something <laughs> so yeah. you're going and talking about very sensitive things sometimes as a teenager if you you know messed up as, as we used to say um to someone who has like no background in being a spiritual father and helping people out of like serious sin um but in their minds they're like well he'll just be led by the spirit like whoever the lord calls the lord will qualify is kind of their whole philosophy mm. but the problem is is that none of their leadership even the top brass of the Mormon Church, their prophet and their apostles, they're all like former business professionals. Like the prophet right now of the Mormon Church, he was a former heart surgeon. Mm. So they don't know anything about theology. They don't know anything about the church fathers. They don't know anything about even, like they probably know the scriptures like, you know, a decent amount, but it's like when you hear them teach and then you go and you listen to like, you know, Father Josiah, it's like night and day because, you know, oh, this man yeah. actually spent his life devoted to, like, the faith and learning the faith and living the faith. So I, I think that's also, like, a big issue is they always brag about they don't have a, a paid clergy. Um, well, the, the apostles and prophets are paid, like, at the top. They actually lied about that. And so very recently they came out that actually they are paid, like, 150000 a year. And wow. everything's covered, housing, food, school for their kids. It's all covered. Uh, maybe stock options that's yeah. kind of coming out as we speak <laughs> but um the bishop is just a volunteer he, he can only spend so much time with you because he has his day job he has his family so he also just can't devote a ton of time to it and this is probably another reason why people don't do confession all the time because i don't even think logistically it could work with the limited time that their clergy has given that it's all lay volunteers is there a ban on alcohol or is it just like looked down upon? I know. Is there a ban on coffee too? I remember like talking to a Mormon. Yeah. What's the reasoning behind that? Uh, no one could tell you <laughs> <laughs> because so coffee, tea, alcohol, tobacco, and drugs, illegal drugs, what they would call illicit drugs. You're allowed to take like, you know, codeine if the doctor gives it to you. Oh. Um, so yeah, like it's just a listen drug right. basically. But yeah, the reason why coffee and tea are um, banned is no one could really tell you. Like some people will say it's the caffeine. Well, yeah, the Mormons drink energy drinks, so obviously that's <laughs> inconsistent. And then they'll be like, well, it's because it's hot. It's a hot drink, which in Joseph Smith's day, I guess they thought hot drinks were bad for the belly. If you like, yeah. you drink something really hot. Well, they drink hot chocolate. So that also <laughs> like doesn't work. Yeah. So it, it's not it's not a consistent thing. It honestly was just made up by um, Joseph Smith was the first to ban tobacco because at that time there was like a um, temperance societies that yeah. were going around the country and they were telling everyone tobacco and alcohol are bad for you. But it wasn't like a cut and dry thing. Like Joseph Smith still smoked tobacco and he still drank, and so did early Mormons. Like they didn't they didn't think there was anything wrong with it. It wasn't until, I think, like, the 1920s, like, around the Prohibition era, that they're like, okay, now we're serious. Now, if you do partake of coffee, tea, tobacco, or alcohol, or drugs, you cannot go to the temple. You cannot be in full fellowship um, or, or partake of the full blessings of the gospel, as they would say. So, yeah, it's a pretty recent development. But, yeah, people are still, I never touched coffee, alcohol, drugs, which is a good thing. Like, I think that's one yeah. of the benefits of me mm -hmm. growing up woman. I never touched any of that stuff, but I literally had coffee for the, my very first time, like <laughs> six months ago or a year ago, <laughs> and I drink it every morning. But yeah, and it's so weird that I drink it, and I'm like, oh, this is, you know, gives me a little pep in my step, but it's so weird that this is seen as like something that can keep me, yeah. you know, out of the astral kingdom. When did it take you to say, you know what, I'm going to like go into an Orthodox church, especially the divine liturgy is like a lot different than the temple or what you were yeah. told before. Yeah. Yeah. So it took me, I'd say a couple of years. Um, and the reason is, is cause I'm married. I, I have yeah. little ones and, um, 
it's just like a big move because my entire family is like very Mormon. They're very active in the church. And so honestly, it was just like fear of the, re- the social repercussions of yeah. coming out and saying like Mormonism isn't true. But I did tell my wife probably like a year and a half in, um, hey, I just don't think Mormonism is true. I've been like studying a lot of the history of Christianity and theology, um, and I just don't find it a compelling worldview. And um, there's a lot of problems with it, too. Yeah. And so I, I didn't, like, you know, come out swinging. I wasn't trying to be, like, you know, bashing it because I know it's, like, still yeah. something that was really important to her at the time. Mm-hmm. But it honestly, like, it, it broke her heart, and it was just kind of like a, a bit of a struggle between us as far as, like, me telling her, like, because she did ask me at that time, like, what do you think is true? Like, are you an atheist now? Like, you know, she was just a little worried about the, uh, you know, instability that I might have been bringing to the marriage. Yeah. But at that time, I could say, you know what, I, I think it's the Orthodox Church. Like, it seems to have, like, the best um, justification for its system of worship and belief and theology as far as, like, having continuity with the Church of the first thousand years. So I, I was able to tell her that. But, again, to, in her mind, she wasn't very familiar with Orthodoxy. She just thought of Orthodoxy as just a bunch of weird monks at a monastery. And she thought I was going to become a monk and <laughs> oh, leave her. Oh, no. <laughs> and, like, you know, just yeah. go live the ascetic life without her. So, yeah, it was a struggle, but um, I will say there was um, a lot of things happening in the LDS church at this time because we had COVID happen. Oh. And, um, yeah, and so, like, the Mormon church shut down, no questions asked, all globally. Like, every temple, every church was closed for nine months. No one was allowed to set foot on any property for nine months. And so this also happened around that time. And so this definitely got my wife thinking like, I mean, it got all of us, like it got a lot of Mormons thinking like, wow, this is, this is really weird that we're just like, you know, bending the knee. We're just like giving up everything that's most precious to us so that, yeah. you know, we can take part in the psyop. So <laughs> like that, I think that's like, honestly was kind of what won my wife over because as we started watching, like, you know, Jay Dyer and also Father Josiah Trenum, um, mm-hmm. she really, like, related with him because he's a father. He has a lot of kids, and she just saw him as a little bit more relatable. Yeah, I think just, like, hearing from him and hearing, like, how he speaks out against, you know, certain cultural agendas um, with boldness but also with love. Um, yeah, just showing her things on YouTube, like, hey, these people are actually serious about their faith, unlike what we're seeing in our camp currently. Yeah. Um, I really think that was like God's way of showing her like the clear <laughs> contrast between like, and I even texted my family about it during, you know, the, the, uh, unfortunate incident, you know, yeah. of 2020, mm-hmm. I, I even texted my family and was like, Hey, this doesn't make sense. The Christians of early Christianity would have never like sent the knee in this way. They were all martyred for their beliefs. And so I, I was like making those connections even to my family and to my wife and, yeah, I think over time she was able to see, like, okay, I think we should take a second look at this. Um, and obviously I told her all the things wrong with Mormonism, and over time that also, like, started to click, like, yeah. uh, Joseph Smith took people's lives, for instance, like, do you feel okay about that? And at first she was like, yeah, I don't think it's a big deal. And then over time she's like, you know what, I, I think it is kind of a big deal as I, again, compare it to real Christians living out their beliefs. Yeah. Wow, that's amazing. So, did you guys go to an Orthodox church as a family, like for the for the first mm-hmm. time, and like convert together as like you know your entire family? Yeah. Um, so I told her, you know, when she was a little bit iffy about it, I told her like, "Well, I'll still go to the Mormon church, but I am joining." Like I just told her that I yeah. am joining, but I'll respect her belief. And honestly, it was kind of like you know, bleak thinking about us being like an inner faith yeah. marriage, whatever they call it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It was just very bleak, but I, I kind of just never really felt too like down about it for some reason. I always just kind of had hope like that truth will win out. Um, and my wife, to her credit, she's super open-minded. Like at no point did she ever like get angry or belligerent with me or defensive. Like she just knew that I was trying to be closer to Christ at the end of the day. Like, I think she could see that and how I was talking about these things with you know, trying to have charity, but also trying to speak truth and boldness. Um, so, yeah, I would say what really, uh, like, it's actually funny. The, the story is, like, we were watching the general conference. It's like a worldwide conference where the Mormon prophets and apostles um, come and speak to the world, but mainly just Mormons. And they watch it on their TV, and it's filmed out of Salt Lake. 
Well, at that time, they supported a really controversial bill here in Arizona where we live. Um, I won't go into the details of it, but it was basically just a super pro skittles bill. Um, And the LDS Church actually, like, came in full support of it. And at that general conference, they basically told all of us, like, you need to be okay with us, you know, supporting things like this. Like, this is the march. Progress marches on, right? (laughs) Um, And at that point, she watched that, and she's just like, all right, let's go check out the Orthodox (laughs) Church. So I was like, all right, all right. (laughs) That's amazing. <laughs> so that was like, like really kind of, kind of pushed her out the door because again she's very traditional minded yeah. and so am I, um, and so they're kind of going that way as a church. Like I guarantee you, in the next twenty years we'll see them, you know, embracing all the things that Protestant churches are embracing. Yeah. Um, so yeah, we went to an Antiochian church in the area. Um, we went to a best first service because I, I heard that was like the best thing to kind of mm-hmm. dip your toe in the water with. And um, I emailed the priest. He was super friendly, tons of converts, tons of families at this parish. It's an amazing parish. Um, the priest and my wife just get along so well. He's, like, so perfect for her as far as, like, his personality versus her personality. Like, I was worried there would be, like, this super, like, stoic, like, stone-faced priest who would just <laughs> tell her to repent. But he, yeah. he was, he's, like, the opposite of that where he's just like, hey, I get it. You know, this is new for you. Like, let's help you kind of learn this slowly at your own pace. Um, so, yeah, very good at catechizing us. And, yeah, we went through catechesis together um, for about a year, and then we were received um, right before Pascha of this year um, wow. with our three children. With our three children, by the way. So, yeah, yeah. family of five, um, all baptizing, chrismated, and, yeah, loving loving our parish, loving the parish life, tons of great friends. Um, so it, it's really been a joy and a blessing to be have a, a parish like this so close to us. You're like your parents, how did, in your, um, you know, other friends, Mormon friends, how did, how did they react? Like, were they okay with it? Cause I know some families would like shun you or like, um, how, how has that been? Yeah. So it's been pretty rough, um, with my parents. And I think yeah. this is more of like a generational thing because my siblings took it a lot better. Um, like, my parents just, like, were heartbroken, you know, in their mind. I'm now an apostate is the word they would use. Like, oh. someone who's left the true faith, someone who's given up all the blessings of the temple for me and my family. Um, so, yeah, understandably, they were, like, devastated. And um, I, I think there just really hasn't been a conversation with a lot of my family because I think they really are hesitant to even go there with me. Like, Hmm. I did write them all an email kind of detailing generally why I was leaving. Um, I talked about how I just felt like I have found the true church. I have found the church established by the apostles and preserved, Mm -hmm. you know, through history to this very day. And that we have bishops who can trace their authority back to the apostles. Um, And so I, I did detail just the basics of why I feel like this is just far more compelling than, you know, what I had before. Um, I did have one of um, one of my siblings talk to me a little bit about it and kind of see why. But again, the conversation is really hard to have because, and you'll find this when you talk to Mormons, the, there's a lot of word concept fallacies when you're dialoguing with Mormons. Like I described like the Trinity and how I always saw that as I was reading the Bible. I always saw that God was tripersonal, mm-hmm. but there was always one God. And that always made me uncomfortable as a Mormon when Jesus said, like, the Father is in me and I am in him, like, you know, the indwelling. I I never could make sense of that from a Mormon worldview, and it almost made me uncomfortable reading those scriptures, because I was always like, something's happening here, or there's something here that's not as simple as just polytheism, obviously. Mm -hmm. So I I tried to explain that to, um, you know, one of my siblings, and they were like, yeah, that's what we believe. Uh, And I was like, no, not really. (laughs) Like, at all. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I think, like, it's always good. And, you know, I've learned this as I've been dialoguing with, you know, Mormons online. And maybe maybe people listening have experiences as well. It's always good to unpack terms. It's always good to, like, explain, like, no, actually, we believe God is uncreated. He's always been God. We believe the Godhead is eternal. They've always been the Godhead. Mm-hmm. Um, we believe they have one will. So you, you have to explain these things because people will be like, oh, yeah, we, we believe something similar to the Trinity or, you know, the triune God, but they don't. Um, and so, yeah, this is where we can kind of get into, you know, the, the differences in theology. But to, to answer your question, yeah, it's been pretty rough, but 
but I think like I, I still try to maintain a relationship with my family because I don't want to have any kind of like, um, you know, that stress hanging over my head or the head of my family. Yeah. But it's definitely different. You know, there's definitely like a, a little bit of awkwardness there for sure. Yeah, one thing that gets me like really excited and I think other, you know, Orthodox people, especially in the online Orthodox community should get excited about is like, it's a sinking ship right now. The Mormon churches. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, there was just a 60 minutes special on the financial scandal, um, that their church is ridden with. And it's also just, there's a lot of good traditionalist minded people, um, like us, like they would agree with us on a lot of things that's happening in the culture right now. You can, you can see their takes on Twitter. They're pretty similar to a take that, you know, you would have as an Orthodox person. Mm -hmm. So I think there's a lot of commonality there as far as like what they want in a society and what they feel like society should place um, high priority on when it comes to like family values, for instance. So I think it's a really exciting time because I think there's going to be a massive disconnect between Mormon leadership and Mormon laity when it comes to the church changing and going with the flow of the world. And I seriously think there's just going to be a lot of people quietly leaving at first, which is what me and other people at my parish who are former Mormons did. Like, you don't really hear about us. But I think over time, like, it's going to be pretty substantial uh, when you see, like, all these people reacting to major changes in the Mormon church that are right on the horizon. Like, they're coming sooner than we think. Yeah. Yeah.